Good morning. Welcome to Bryn Zion Church Online. We are so glad to have you join with us in worship this morning. Today is Remembrance Sunday. We're starting our service a little later today so that we were all able to join in the National Act of Remembrance by way of the two minutes silence on our doorsteps at 11 o'clock this morning. And as we come to worship today, we remember with a deep sense of gratitude those who have laid down their lives to fight against tyranny. We recall with a profound sense of thankfulness, God's faithfulness in times of peril. He is, in the words of Psalm 46, a refuge and a strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. We also pray for all who have been and still are the victims of the unspeakable horrors of war. And we look forward to the day when the Prince of Peace shall reign. And in the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So let's pray together. Joel is going to pray now. Let's pray. Gracious God, we pray for peace in your world, for all national leaders, that they might have the wisdom to know and the courage to do what is right. For all men and women, that their hearts may be turned to yourself in the search for righteousness and truth. For those who are working and to improve the international relationships, that they might find the true way of reconciliation. For those who suffer as a result of war, the injured and disabled, the mentally distressed, the homeless and hungry, and those who mourn their dead and especially for those who are without hope or friend. To sustain them in their grief, God of grace, hear our prayer. Through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and the Saviour of our world. Amen. Thank you, Joel, for that prayer. As we remember the sacrifice of those who lay down their lives for our freedoms and honour them, we also lift up our eyes and recall the greatest sacrifice of the Son of God who gave his life so that we might live and we worship him. So let's worship the Lord together now. You can worship at home. You can use the comments section below on Facebook here to worship the Lord and to encourage one another. Later in the service, I'll be bringing the next instalment in the life of Abraham, the series we are following. Also, just to remind you that from next Sunday, we'll be back to meeting in person again on Sunday morning. And if you would like to join us in person, we would love to see you. Please complete our Google book booking form. And if you don't have access to that Google form, please message us and we can get it to you. And then church online next Sunday will be at six o'clock in the evening, not 11 or 11.15 in the morning, six o'clock in the evening and we'll have a worship service then. So let's worship the Lord together now.
known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for this day, Lord, that you've given to us, that we can lift our hearts and praise you and say thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. The joy of the Lord is my strength this morning. There's nowhere else that we can turn to but to you. And I just want to praise you for who you are for what you are in my life, Lord. And I just want to give you the glory for being such an awesome God, for protecting me day by day, for looking after your people, Lord, and giving them strength to face every day with you. We thank and praise you, Lord. Amen.
So good morning once again, and we're going to come to our next instalment in the Life of Abraham series, The Walk of Faith. And this morning we're going to come to Genesis 15, the most wonderful chapter. And so what I would like to do is imagine this is a suitcase and we are literally just opening it up and I'm just going to unpack this chapter for us this morning. I'm sure we all like to feel assured. Whether that's just let me check I locked the door and switch off the heating or um, do you have the tickets or um, when establishing an important agreement. Could I have that in writing, please? Well, on his walk of faith, we found that Abraham had received many promises from God. We've seen the faith that enabled him to leave the past, trust God for the future and put God first in the present. The faith that worked generosity in his life and through which he could trust God to make choices for his life. The faith that went after a brother in need and saw Jesus. Today in Genesis chapter 15, we see the faith through which he receives two wonderful gifts, righteousness and assurance. I'll read this chapter in two parts. The first part is verses one through to six. And please follow along in your own Bibles or if you've got the Bible on your phone, it'd be really useful to follow along this morning. So Genesis chapter 15, reading from verse one through to six. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Do you know, Abraham had upset the kings who took Lot, his nephew, captive when he attacked their armies to rescue Lot. His position, you could say, was now, well, vulnerable. How wonderful it was then that the Lord spoke the words that are first used here in the Bible and become a continual theme throughout the Bible from this point onwards. Do not fear. God would be his shield and a very great reward. This prompted Abraham to recall the promises he had received, particularly that he would be the father of many. He finally asks, well, Lord, how is this going to happen? How is this going to work since I'm childless and my heir is one of my household servants, um, Eliezer? Then God specifically told him that he, Abraham, would have a son, one born of him. He told Abraham to go outside and look up at the stars and see if he could count them. Because of the, the, the light pollution across large parts of our country today, we might not really quite appreciate this. I recall an occasion when I lived in the Highlands I made my way back home to Inverness from a group meeting I had just led in Ullapool. It was a clear, crisp winter's night and the road was completely deserted. No one, no light source for miles upon miles. I pulled into a lay-by, I switched off my car lights, I got out my car and I looked up to the sky between the mountains in the glen there and the more I looked the more I saw until I was almost pretty sure that there were more stars up there than black sky to be seen. Count them? Impossible. And that's exactly what Abraham saw. And now we might 
consider that picture and think that God was showing Abraham all his natural descendants, those born of him. But actually, close study here tells us that that's not what God was showing him. You see, the word offspring here, or seed it might say in your version of the Bible, is in the singular, not the plural. God was showing him not many descendants naturally born of him, but one descendant in particular. And so who? Which descendant? The book of Galatians in chapter 3 verse 16 gives us an answer. The apostle Paul there says this, the promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. The scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. And so it follows then in verse 29 of Galatians 3, if you belong to Christ, Paul says there, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, when Abraham looked up on that starry night, he didn't just see um, he didn't just see the miracle of his natural descendants and God's plan for his nation. He got a glimpse of his seed, Christ. And God's saving plan for those from every nation, tribe and tongue, even right down through the millennia to you this very day. Now, you may just be thinking at this time, that sounds really far fetched. Well, can I just say, it's not just the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Galatians that tells us this. But it's the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that tells us this. In John chapter 8, verse 56, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Hear that? Abraham saw Christ. Jesus tells us. Hebrews chapter 11 says he welcomed him from a distance. I don't know exactly what Abraham saw how he saw it, how much it was, how it was revealed. But I do know this because Jesus tells me it's true, that when Abraham looked up on that starry night, he saw God's plan of salvation. So why is all this important? Because next we come to one of the most important verses in the whole of scripture. Verse six says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. What did Abraham believe? He looked up to the stars and believed in the Christ. With the little he saw at that time, he trusted in God's salvation plan. Now, notice it doesn't say in verse 6, Abraham left Haran and his father's house and it was credited to him as righteousness. Or Abraham built an altar to the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Or Abraham was generous or Abraham rescued Lot. None of these good works could work for his credit with God. None could make him right with God. Can I say this morning, we are all bankrupt in sin. None of us have anything that can get us out of that bankruptcy before God. It's by faith alone that we are saved and credited with God's righteousness. And God wipes away our sin and declares us justified before him, just as if we never had sinned. So as Abraham looked up into the, the splendours of the universe, he saw the riches of Christ and he believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you know, there's 
a common error that goes something like this. God wanted to save us, so he gave us the law through, ten, uh, through, through Moses, you know, Ten Commandments and the, the 600 plus other laws that we see in Leviticus and so on. So that if we followed it perfectly, we would be saved, but we couldn't. So God um, came up with another plan and sent Jesus to die for us all instead. Can I say that is not what the Bible teaches? God gave the law through Moses, not to save us from sin, but to reveal his holiness, his desire that his people would be uniquely his among the nations of the world. And ultimately, the law reveals our sin and how far we fall short of God's glory. But God's plan has always, always been faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ. That's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Once again, that's the message of Galatians 3. Please study it in your own time. You see, there's a cross that towers over all creation and all time. It's in every page of scripture, we could say, and it's here in our text today. Abraham, believed in Christ and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so he is the father today of all of us who believe. So let's see what else we can learn from Abraham today from Genesis 15. I'm going to continue to read from verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? That's a key question. How am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abraham. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners, in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. But as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. Then you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying to your offspring, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. So God promised Abraham afresh in verse seven that he would possess the land but Abraham said, well, how can I be sure that this will happen? And so we come back to the theme I started with today, assurance. And God told him to get three animals and two birds and with the animals to cut them in two. Now, this sounds absolutely bizarre to us today. It's definitely not what we would do, but or definitely not what we do today. But in Abraham's world, it made total sense. This was actually God saying, 
get the papers together. I'm going to put this in writing and sign the contract. In Abraham's world, a contract between two parties would be binding upon a covenant. Animals would be sacrificed and cut in two, and the two parties would walk hand in hand through the middle of these carcasses. It was a sign that if either party went back on the agreement, what happened to the animals should be what happened to them. We actually see this referred to, you can look it up in Genesis, uh, sorry, in Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 18 and 19. It's actually why the Hebrew word for covenant means to cut. So by telling Abraham to go and get these animals, God was saying to Abraham, I'll show you how you can be sure. I'm going to form a covenant with you, a binding agreement. Now, you may be thinking, Ian, please speak to me in my world today. What does this have to do with me? How is this going to get me through the week I've got coming up? Well, can I say, please bear with me. I am speaking to your world. You see, we're establishing some wonderful truths from Genesis chapter 15. Firstly, Abraham is the father of us all who believe. He's an example, if you like. Abraham was declared righteous by God through faith alone. And so are we today. Then Abraham was brought into a covenant with God, a binding agreement. And I'm going to say this morning, so are we. And if you will grasp this, it will totally transform, I promise you, your approach to anything and everything you face this week. You can be assured of that which is even too wonderful to truly sum up in words. And let's just look at this in a bit more detail. So Abraham took a whole day to get the paperwork together, if you like, the, the sacrifices and the parts arranged appropriately. And then he had to spend time fighting away the birds of prey. Do you know, it's really interesting in the Old Testament law, the birds of prey were classified as unclean animals. They speak of the things of sin, perhaps, that always try to steal away the work of Christ in our lives. Then, after a long day, nothing has happened. And after a day of obedience, darkness sets in and weariness overtakes Abraham. Let me ask, what do we do when we do everything God asks, but nothing happens or perhaps things don't happen as we would expect them to? Well, Abraham fell into a deep sleep and then it says a deep Darkness and dread came upon him. Maybe it was a healthy fear of the Lord that's being um, described here. Or maybe, as I tend to believe, it was actually a gloom that came upon Abraham. Do you know those fears of the night um, that even the most saintly are not immune to? That overwhelming, emotionless emotion that you will never feel normal again. When depressive feelings become like a smothering blanket, a deep darkness and dread came upon Abraham. There's a story of a church minister called George Matheson who was blind and suffering a bout of depression. Like darkness descended and began to suffocate him. And then in a moment, words came to him, just a few words that would become the words of a, a well-known hymn that many Christians have sung over decades, over a century. O oh, love that will not let me go. And in the final verse, he would eventually write, O oh, joy that seeks me through the pain. I dare not close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and know the promise is not vain 
that morn shall tearless be. A moment of deep assurance in a place of gloom. And I'm going to say, friends, there is assurance this morning through the gloom for you today. And that's what happened to Abraham here. God brings words of assurance to Abraham. We read in the text from verse 8 here. Words that reveal God's gracious and just character. He says in, in verse 13, no for certain, God says to him, no for certain. I love that. You can be certain in uncertain and gloomy days. He tells Abraham of what would happen to his descendants in Egypt and how then God would bring them out and give them the land of promise. He speaks of the fact that he would only give Abraham's descendants to the land when their when through their sin the Amorites who lived in that land would forfeit it themselves. You see all of God's ways are just and now hearing these words and coming to see who God is would have been wonderful for Abraham but what happened next was the actual moment that changed everything for Abraham. Suddenly there was a sound and a light Abraham looked to see what looked like um, smoke and fire, revealing the presence of the Lord in judgment and light and truth and mercy. Now, remember what I said about the two parties walking between the, the parts of the sacrifice hand in hand. But here there's only one, the presence, the fire of the Lord himself. After all, Abraham could bring nothing or do nothing in his slumber and in his darkness. The Lord did it himself and then made a covenant outlining the land promised to him. Now, I don't know if you've just realised how significant that was. You see, Abraham had sought assurance and the Lord graciously gave him it, but Abraham didn't do it or take part in it. And that, my friends, is the very point. You see, the Lord was saying, Abraham, this is how you can be totally assured that my promise is true to you. It does not depend on anything you have done. If you're unfaithful, Abraham, the covenant still stands. The promise is all depending on me and I do not lie and I cannot fail. And can I say, friends, 2,000 years ago, not a three-year-old animal of service, but the servant of the Lord, Jesus Christ, after three years of ministry, stretched out his arms on the cross and took upon himself all your sin and all my sin. And God's judgment was worked out there on him. The punishment was taken out on him and he did it all alone. The father, if you like, walked through that sacrifice. And that's how we can be a totally assured people. That's how we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt his righteousness, forgiveness, great love, eternal life, all the riches of his grace, because it does not depend on us. It does not depend on our feelings. It does not depend on what happens to us. It all depends on that once and for all work that God did in Christ on that cross 2,000 years ago and now we can face anything assured that we win, we inherit, we are his and that my friends is assurance. Oh my friends you don't need some touchy feeling servant on the eight steps to living Fear free from the life of Abraham or the seven keys to living a confident life. You just need to see Jesus as Abraham did. If your assurance of salvation depends on your works, you can never, ever be assured. But it doesn't. It depends 
on the Christ of that cross that towers over history and the empty tomb that reveals our destiny. There is nothing, no fear, no difficult meeting, no operation, no looming deadline that you cannot face this week with confidence that no matter what, you are his. So do not fear, the Lord says, I am your shield and your very great reward. How do we know? Because it doesn't depend on us but on Christ and what he has done. In the words of the song we sing in church, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Oh joy that seeks me through the pain. I dare not close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain, and know, and know for certain, the promise is not vain. God doesn't make flimsy promises. Today, look to Jesus, trust in him, and know for certain, he is your shield and your very great reward.
watching this morning everyone we know church looks a little different when we do it online and we can't see each other's faces but just know that every view and every interaction is so appreciated so we hope you've been encouraged this morning we hope you've been blessed and maybe even challenged by this morning's message and if you enjoyed this morning's service please stay tuned on our facebook and youtube channels and we will be continuing our abraham series over the next few weeks and if you'd like to find out more about who we are as a church and what we do as a church, then please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Or maybe something particular spoke to you today and you'd like to talk to someone about it, then again, don't hesitate to get in contact with us or message anyone that was involved in the service this morning. And we'd love to have a chat with you just to see where you're at. So, yeah, thank you everyone for watching and we'll just close in pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I just thank you for every, each and every person that turned into church this morning. I pray that we will carry this morning's message with us this week as we go back to our school, our work, and as some lockdown restrictions lift, Lord, I pray for your protection over us and over our community, Lord. We can't be together as we normally would, and we're so looking forward to the day where we can all cram into the Atrakanan Hall. But I just wonder if anyone watching this morning felt like you were speaking directly to them and they felt that stirring in their hearts, Jesus, then they would have the courage and trust to reach out, Lord, and that you would comfort them as they take that step of faith. So I pray that you bless everyone in our church family this week. We are forever grateful for them, Lord, and we can't wait until we can gather together again. In your mighty name we pray, Jesus. Amen.